Good afternoon to all my colleagues from all over the world. I would like to welcome you today with this web-based webinar, education webinar, launched by EDIC Dubai. Special thanks to Dr. Abdesalam Salam Madani and the EDIC Dubai team for launching this web-based web -based education webinar in this hard pandemic situation to exchange knowledge between each others. Today, we have Professor Osama Shahawi. Professor Osama Shahawi, he's a professor of pediatric dentistry, Cairo University. He is the head of pediatric department, Future University, Cairo, Egypt. He is the president of the uh, Egyptian Society of Pediatric Dentistry and Children with Special Needs. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you, Professor Osama, with us today. Uh, your lecture uh, will be on the um, first permanent uh, molar challenges in, in its first year. For the attendees, please keep your mic off. And if you have any questions, please drop the questions in the Q&A icons. Dr. Osama will be lecturing his lecture within 50 to 45 minutes. Then the last 15 minutes uh, will answer your question after reviewing from me and the EDIC team. Regard the CME, please follow the instructions that appear in the link below. Now I will give the floor to Professor Usama to start his lecture. So please, Dr. Usama, start. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy to be with you today. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nawan, for the kind presentation. And I would uh, like to thank EDIC Dubai for uh, this very good initiative uh, to uh, prepare this web-based uh, webinars, which is a very good opportunity for us all to meet and uh, uh, share our thoughts and share our knowledge. I chose to talk today about the challenges of the first permanent molar, which is actually a challenge not only to the general practitioner, but also it's a challenge to the pediatric dentists. The first permanent molar arises or erupts in the oral cavity of our children in a very young age, which is approximately, as we all know, the age of six. So, so we see these teeth in a very uh, early age and accordingly we have to deal with it either even if not affected and definitely if it's affected. My presentation today will focus on some points that cover this topic and definitely as we all know we need to have hours to cover each topic of them but my uh, uh, presentation today is aiming at putting some highlights on the strategy of managing these teeth whenever we have problems arising in it. So we will pass by eruption dates, definitely, as we all know, and we will see some early problems that may be encountered starting from the eruption, like delayed eruption or ectopic eruption, or sometimes pericoronitis, and we will pass by the developmental defects that can be affecting these teeth with a special emphasis uh, and some developmental defects. And I was telling now the MIH, which we will go uh, into further details on it. And how can we deal with caries, which we all know, but we will see the most relevant strategies doing that. And we will touch the pulp therapy or pulp management for these teeth. And definitely we'll talk about prevention. As I started, we are facing these teeth in a very young age, as we can see now, it's about the age of six to seven years of age. And at this age, we definitely know that the child is not fully cooptive and not always fully cooptive. And this is a permanent tooth coming out this age and we want to maintain it and keep it as a very good candidate in the oral cavity for the rest of the child's life or the person. One of the very first things that we see uh, happening is the ectopic eruption, which sometimes happens and uh, it has some consequences. And the best thing to handle these cases is the early diagnosis or when we see the problem at the beginning and try to help in managing 
these cases. Sometimes it's advanced and sometimes it goes with a, a very big uh, destruction to the second primary molar to the point that we cannot help except pulling this primary tooth out. And sometimes we have pain and we have neurologic symptoms which we don't have any justification for it. And at the end, we have to handle the first permanent molar, getting it back or retracting it to the normal position. And this usually happens more in the upper arch. A quick classification to that, just to throw light about the problem and how it, it may be sometimes manageable if we have the proper diagnosis and uh, the, the uh, anticipation of it. Sometimes it's mild, so it's limited to resorption of the cementum, sometimes more, which is moderate. <clears throat> when it uh, takes part of the dentine, not exposing the pulp of the primary second molar, and at these stages, we can still do something. Uh, now it's not the, the proper uh, time to talk about that because it takes a long, it's an interceptive thing. But I just wanted to highlight here that we are, uh, or we should be able to diagnose the problem and try to solve it as early as possible in this situation. So ectopic eruption is the very first thing that can happen while this tooth is erupting. After the eruption of the tooth, we have to have some preventive strategies for these teeth as we all learned and practiced. And in this sense, we can describe applying fluoride varnish, especially the fluoride varnish is now considered one of the best scenarios that we can help preventing caries with. And as we all see and we all uh, do, is applying Fisher sealants, which is a very good uh, preventive tool, but definitely whenever indicated. So sometimes we advise to put uh, Fisher sealant while it's not indicated, and this is wrong, definitely. So the proper indication of putting Fisher sealant is very important, and if we abide by that and apply the sealant, it definitely can help in preventing these teeth from getting decay at these very first dates. Because again, as we know in these very first dates, the oral hygiene measures are not usually the best. And definitely the diet is sometimes not maintained properly. And if the primary teeth has problems, so this can affect the first permanent molar and we definitely don't want this to happen. So sealants and fluoride varnish as preventive measures can play a very good role on that. But again, as anything can happen, we can advise by prevention and we can try to do our best to put a preventive strategy, but problems happen. And the most common problem in even everything is having decay. So decay is, as we all know, variable, variable in depth and in width and in everything. And we are not going to take, uh, to take the time today to uh, advise on how to, to deal with the decay. But we have to emphasize here and say that the adhesive restorations are the most common and the best to be used to uh, uh, take care of this decay that is happening in the, this tooth in this early stages. One of the most challenging situations now and the situation that a lot of uh, academicians and uh, scientists are going after, which is called the molar incisor hypomineralization, which I'm uh, sure that every one of you heard about it before. MIH is a challenging situation, and unfortunately, it's happening a lot. The prevalence is recorded to be very high in some populations. Some of them reported 10, and others reported 20%, and in some communities, it's reported up to 40%, which is too much. So the problem with molar incisor hypermineralization that it appeared to be very big happening, it's one, of, as we mentioned, of the uh, developmental defects that can affect these teeth and definitely needs intervention. And 
I thought of uh, addressing this point uh, widely now. We have a lot of predisposing factors, but it's not yet determined what is the real cause of having this uh, situation, which affects from the name, as we can see, it affects the first permanent molar and affects the incisors as well. Not always, but sometimes it affects the incisors. The main features that we can see in these defects or the molar incisor hypomineralization is what is called demarcated opacities. So demarcated opacities, just like we can see here in this molar, sometimes comes in a wide form and definitely the opacity is due to a change in the amount of calcification of this area of this patch which uh, makes the uh, light transmission when the light is thrown on it different than the neighboring natural enamel so it gives the shape of the opacity or what we call again a demarcated opacity and as we've mentioned also it can happen in the anteriors or the incisors, as we can see it here in the upper and lower incisors. Sometimes this demarcated opacity goes to be yellowish or tends to be having a yellow color. And sometimes it goes to brown, so a darker color can be noticed. So when we see these demarcated opacities in the first permanent molar, we anticipate the condition, which is again called MIH. The other feature that happens after, or maybe when we see the demarcated opacities, is what we call the post-eruptive enamel breakdown. So the post-eruptive enamel breakdown entails having some of the enamel of these teeth broken down. And again, just like everything, there is some grades of it. So in this case, as we can see, there is a mild post-eruptive enamel breakdown. It is in the molar as well, post-eruptive enamel breakdown, which is in a mild form. And sometimes it's a moderate or more parts of the tooth are lost. And unfortunately, this can lead to a superimposed decay, as you can see in the picture on the right side. So there is a demarcated opacity, there is a post-enamel eruptive enamel breakdown and superimposed by decay. So the condition is more and more complicated. And sometimes, unfortunately, we see this severe post-eruptive enamel breakdown. So it's a challenging situation. When I have a child again, let's imagine we have a child of six or seven years of age and having all this amount of problems and destruction in this first measurement tool. One of the most recent concepts and index for identifying the problems that it's happening in the affected teeth or the MIH teeth is what it's called the Wurzberg concept or the MIH treatment needs index. This index was there to classify the uh, uh, amount of destruction and the sensitivity that is a common feature that is accompanying these defects. So unfortunately, in a lot of cases, we anticipate to have extra sensitivity in these teeth. So as we can see briefly here in this index, we have no MIH, which is zero index, and index one where we can see MIH, but fortunately with no hypersensitivity and no enamel breakdown, and going through two, three, four, where we can see the interplay between having no hypersensitivity but enamel breakdown with different uh, amounts and grades, either one third, two thirds, and three thirds of the defect, and ending at the worst thing, which is index four, where we have both we have the hypersensitivity and the enamel breakdown with different degrees. So what is the clinical challenging things that we can see when we are handling such cases in the first permanent mode? As I've said, the sensitivity and rapid development of dental caries, which can be superimposed on these teeth, is a challenge. 
So there is a high sensitivity. You can see the child coming to the practice and he's saying that he is uh, uh, feeling a very sensitive tooth in this area. He cannot eat properly. He cannot drink soft and uh, uh, cold drinks easily. So the sensitivity sometimes is a feature and definitely limited cooperation of a child Difficulty of achieving anesthesia, and then this is a big challenge in these cases when we administer local anesthesia. Not in every case we succeed to have a profound anesthesia that makes us easily uh, uh, treat these teeth. And definitely because we don't have, and this is a very important part of the strategic thoughts of treating these teeth, is that we have a repeated marginal breakdown of the restorations. Why is that? Because when we do the preparation and when we remove parts of the tooth aiming at putting an adhesive restoration, for example, sometimes the operator is not uh, well determined on where to stop removing and where to place the margins or the interface between the restoration and the tooth. So sometimes uh, the effective part is left or an undermined part is left. So we see a lot, a marginal breakdown of the restorations or a problem at the interface, which will result on the long term of having uh, leakage and failure of the restoration. Also, there is always a conflict on using or selecting a suitable restorative material. Should I be using glass ionomer or should I be using composite or should I be using a crown? We will go through that and see the rationale of each thing. And by the way, when we are talking about MIH, because it's the most prevalent thing now, we will be talking about a broken down first permanent molar. So the restorative strategy here applied to the MIH is very likely or uh, is similar to destructed, the management uh, strategy for uh, destructed permanent molar for caries reason. So what we are going to, to, uh, to, uh, to tackle here will be okay for both. There is uh, uh, many approaches, but I found that this approach was very comprehensive, which was called by the authors William et al, six step approach to management. It entails six steps in your way of thinking about handling these cases. Starting from the risk identification, and by the way, the risk identification or the risk assessment is a key factor in having any treatment. So even if you have caries only, and even if the caries for primary teeth, whatever, if we do not as, uh, respect the risk, we will fail. So respecting the risk and handling the case or building my strategy around the risk of the patient is a very important key for success. So here by the authors, they say that assess the medical history and putative etiologic factors to anticipate if this child will be having this problem or not. And nowadays there is a genetic essays that can be in the future in hand to identify a lot of problems that uh, or developmental problems that may be attacking and maybe one day we will be able to use that easily. And as always, early diagnosis, it's very important to do the early diagnosis. The examination of the risk molar may be in the radiographic uh, pictures. Sometimes we can visualize that early in a radiograph. And if we suspected that, we should be monitoring these teeth during eruption. Because if we monitor that and we have the anticipation that this condition will be happening, we can help by starting a remineralization process coupled by desensitization, which definitely can be done using topical fluoride, sometimes by using remineralizing agents as the most famous recall dent. So remineralization and desensitization can be applied early if we anticipated that. And definitely we don't want to have a superimposing decay. So 
How can we achieve that? Definitely with prevention of dental caries and post eruptive enamel breakdown. So if I examined the child and I found the uh, signs of demarcated opacities and a start of destruction of the enamel or the, 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 the defective enamel, so I should be advising the child or the parents to make the child go away from an erosive or hard stuff that can danger these teeth. So proper oral hygiene and reduce the cariogenicity of the erosive diet. Then if we have the problem happening, we should intervene. We should do our job, our bread and butter, which is the restoration or the latest or the, the last choice, which is sometimes a good choice, as we will see, the extraction. And the maintenance, which comes in monitoring the margins of the restoration and consider at a certain point, even if I started with regular restoration, considering full coverage for longer term success. So this is the step-by-step -step strategy of thinking in managing these teeth. And again, we can use that the same if we are even managing other developmental defects like amelogenesis or hypoplasia or dentinogenesis or whatever, because it's, it carries the same sense. And even if we are talking about dental decay. The very first management for the molar incisor hypomineralization, and it was a very nice approach, which is definitely as we all want to have a minimal invasive treatment. So the minimal invasive treatment for molar incisor hypomineralization was considered something very good, and it can be achieved using uh, application of silver diamine fluoride and high viscosity glass ionomer. Silver diamine fluoride is now emerging, and you may all encounter that, and it's very good in stopping the progress of decay and as well doing some remineralization and also it can help in desensitization. The problem with that is it causes discoloration, but using glass ionomer over it will do both. We can restore the broken part and also we can stop the sensitivity and stop the progress. In terms of restoring teeth, if you're talking about a destructed tooth as we can see, the first option, as we said, is putting composite restoration. This is the classic thing. And there is a lot of research going on now, trying to see what's the best scenario, because some researchers started to uh, uh, talk about the possibilities of having this enamel uh, adhering properly to the adhesive restoration either yes or not, and what's the best, and where is the, the, the limit where I can put this restorative material. So a lot is coming out on this. But again, adhesive restorative uh, technique using composite resin is a very good approach. In a review about the molar incisor hypermineralization, we can see here if we went to the other option, which is coverage, we will find that we have several options. The first of them is the preformed metal crowns, which is our classic scenario, and it's very good, rather than having it in the silver uh, color, but it's a very good alternative. And the tooth color indirect inlay, which we call ultra-thin occlusal veneers. This is a new approach, but it also can be used to do a good coverage to the occlusal surface of these teeth. And like previously was described, the preformed malleable composite temporary crowns. The uh, example of that is the 3M pro temp crowns, and this was used uh, by a lot of clinicians. And to advance that, we can have the CAD crowns, the CAD cut crowns, and most recently, there is a preformed zirconia crowns, or what we call youth crowns. So, in this destruction, cases, as we can see here, hypomineralized or decayed, or having this amount of destruction, we can still think of having the stainless steel crown, as we mentioned, which is a very good option. And if we are talking about an aesthetic alternative, we have 
the youth crown or the aesthetic zirconia crowns, which is very good alternative and with very good uh, uh, gingival integration. As we can see, these are some of the cases that was done with that. And it's the best thing that it doesn't want any impressions or machines or something. It comes in sizes as the same as the stainless steel crown. So it provides another alternative for treating this badly broken down teeth. So let's move on to the pulp treatment. How about if we have a pulp involvement? And as we all know, it's a level, it's levels. So it starts with a deep cavity in which we can apply indirect pulp capping. And if we have the exposure starting from direct pulp capping, shallow pulpotomy, coronal radicular pulpotomy, and going through regenerative endodontics and pulpectomy. Again, we need hours to talk about that, but I want to highlight three parts of it. We're talking about indirect pulp capping, so if we're talking about indirect pulp capping, we have to know that this is one of the most preferred techniques whenever indicated. So it's very important to properly diagnose the tooth and properly isolate the tooth and remove the decay on the walls and leave, as we can sometimes say, incomplete caries removal and leave the most deep leathery layer of decay and perform proper seal. If we perform that properly, we will save this tooth a lot of future hassles and stop the process of decay. So indirect pulp capping is one of the preferred uh, uh, techniques if afforded. All through the rest of these techniques, and definitely in the last period, we have good materials that is still advancing that will help in performing these techniques in a proper way and successful way. We have the MTA, we have biodentin, and we have the calcium enriched mixtures and all these materials are definitely helping in performing what we uh, aim at. If we're talking about calcium enriched mixtures or calcium enriched cements, uh, there is this study by Asgari et al. 2015 was a very very good study and it enlightened a lot uh, of us as they had a five-year results of vital pulp therapy in permanent molars with irreversible pulpitis. See how far did we go. We are talking about here treating irreversible pulpitis using a calcium-enriched mixture. So the idea is having proper isolation again and no contamination at all and trying to remove as least as possible from the pulp and at the end, putting this calcium enriched materials and uh, uh, restoring the tooth. And they had very good results, which was comparable in the clinical results to the full endodontic treatment, and even better results when it came to the radiographic results of these uh, approaches. So, using the calcium enriched mixture, and removing the least amount, or we can say uh, shallow pulpotomy or partial pulpotomy, uh, can result in a very good result with these materials, either again in immature or mature permanent molars with irreversible pulpitis. So let's move on to the immature non vital, which poses a very big challenge to the operators. Are we able? to treat an immature, non-vital, permanent posterior tooth? And the answer is again, if it's properly diagnosed, properly indicated, we can still do that using the regenerative endodontic technique, especially that there are debates now about the success of the regenerative endodontic treatment after traumatic injuries, because uh, there is a doubt that the success in these cases is less than the success if we perform it regenerative endodontic treatment after a problem related to decay. 
and definitely in the first permanent molar, it's all about decay, it's not about trauma. So what are the considerations for regenerative endodontic treatment? The considerations are that the patient is young, necrotic pulp and immature apex. We have minimum, we have to do minimal instrumentation. These are the general guidelines on that. Placement of intracanal medication, blood clot or protein scaffold if needed, and effective coronal seal, which is the very important of all. So these are the considerations, and we will go through the last revised uh, consideration of the re regenerative endodontics by the American Academy of Endodontics. Using triple antibiotic mix can be done with low, very low concentration, but they prefer now to use calcium hydroxide as an intracanal medicament, and double antibiotic mix was preferred for many reasons. And Sodium hypochlorite can also be used, but in a low concentration to get away from any cytotoxic effect. So 1.5% sodium hypochlorite can be used, and then we reverse the effect of the sodium hypochlorite using EDTA, 17%, and in the same time, it, enhance, it enhances the release of growth factors from the dentinal walls. We can do a clot from the apical we, we, we should do an apical stimulation and sometimes use the scaffold and place a resorbable matrix, just the cola, cola tape or cola plug, and by the end, we should do proper coronal seal. These are the main heads about regenerative endodontic, endodontics, briefly. And what do we need to reach what or what is the degree of success that the regenerative endodontics should lead us to. The primary goal is the elimination of the symptoms and the evidence of bone healing. And the secondary goal is increased root wall thickness and increased root length. And these are the, the perfect aims if achievable. And the tertiary goal if again achievable is the positive response or regaining the vitality of the tooth if possible. And these are uh, uh, pictures of uh, one of the research that we conducted in Cairo University and it was aiming at performing regenerative endodontic treatment in this uh, first permanent molar and it showed a very good degree of success in having a resolution of the infection, which is the first aim, and apical closure in some of the cases. We will finalize by the last option. What is the last option? We can also think in sometimes of extracting these first permanent molars, either affected by decay or affected by developmental defects. As we can see in this panoramic X-ray, we have to the left side, we have uh, one in the lower and the upper one is free as it looks in the X-ray. And in the other right side, we have the upper and the lower are badly decayed. And we anticipate here pulp involvement with all the consequences of having uh, or in need for pulp management and also all the consequences of restoring this badly broken down uh, superstructure. And leaving this child with these teeth or these uh, uh, extensively treated teeth till the end of his age. So that's a challenge. Should we go through this or should we pull this teeth out and bear the consequences that will happen? Again, this is a choice that it's academically proven to be effective, especially if we have three out of four, as in this case. And we have ideal situations with which will definitely, if all satisfied, will lead to a perfect end result. And sometimes we don't have all the perfect results, but we can still take the decision and pull the state teeth out. And again, with uh, communication with the parents and with their approval. So let's see the ideal situation which will make us happy 
to take this decision. So this is the affected permanent molar. What we should see in the panoramic X-ray is that we already have the second premolar in place, which we know in the lower jaw that sometimes it's congenitally missing. So we should again ideally have a second primary molar, uh, premolar present, and this is the first uh, thing to consider. And we should be having the wisdom tooth bud or the third molar in place because again we need to have two molars per side after removing this tooth because if you don't have the wisdom tooth we will end up by having just one molar per side again this may not uh, make us refrain about the, uh, the decision of extraction but again now we are talking about the ideal situation that should be there to promote us to deliver this service to this child. And the best timing is the timing where the second permanent molar is just in the stage of the furcation uh, formation, meaning that it is the start of the formation of the roots, because at this stage, we can anticipate that this tooth will take the full direction, bodily movement, and take the seat of the, the, the empty seat of the first permanent molar properly. So these are the main criteria. And if we also have what we call minimal buccal segment crowding, which means we have, as in this case, we have an, uh, an obvious uh, crowding in the premolar area, this will mean that when the second permanent molar move mesially, body movement as we're telling, it will come in good contact with the second premolar properly. So this will be again an ideal ending position for the situation. So these are the uh, uh, proper or ideal situation and again we can sometimes have three out of four or two out of four and still take the decision. And this is according to the situation of the child because if the child is uncooptive and if the teeth are badly broken down to the point that restoration will be just wasting everything, wasting the time and wasting the efforts and having the child to a general anesthesia with, with an anticipated uh, further problems due to improper endodontic treatment or even successful endodontic treatment but radiographically not successful, whatever situation we're having or failure of the restoration or failure of the crown. So we are leaving this child with something that he doesn't uh, definitely want to have inside. So the decision of extraction is a good option at the end. By this, uh, I thank you all for your uh, uh, listening and definitely uh, we touched uh, uh, some of the points but each one of the points needs a lot to talk about. Maybe later we can have better chances to tackle uh, the details of each of the points later on and I'm happy to receive your questions now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Osama, for this amazing uh, lecture. Uh, we have some questions from the attendees. Would you please uh, answer some of them? And uh, if, we, if they have any questions, please uh, send to us by email. The first question is, uh, during which period of age we can extract the first molar to repla replace by second molar? Very good question. Uh, definitely uh, the chronology, as we all know, we have different uh, aspects concerning the chronology because when we are talking about the dental age and the chronological age, we have some variations. So we have to be very aware when we're talking about numbers concerning this. But generally speaking, we can say that at the age of eight and a half till the age of 10, which is again the age of the formation of furcation of the second permanent molar or the seven as we name it 
is the best timing to start doing this. And I have to emphasize again, sometimes we don't have the ideal uh, situation, but we can still think of doing that. Okay, the other question is, the, uh, should we worry about over eruption or opposing to when we decide extraction? Definitely. This is a, a, a very uh, important aspect. And this can sometimes uh, dictate that we can pull out an upper sound molar just to make sure that there is no over eruption because the over eruption will definitely uh, result in many defects. The first of them is it will hinder the proper eruption of the second a permanent molar in the lower jaw. So uh, uh, this, uh, this problem usually happens when we are talking about uh, a badly decayed lower permanent molar, but it's not the same problem because in class one uh, occlusion, uh, we don't have the same problem if we are pulling out an upper molar, meaning yani, if it's class one, we can remove the upper badly broken down molar and leave the lower sound one, but the reverse is not possible. So the consideration, as we uh, usually say, it's called balancing and compensation. So compensation is very important not to have over eruption and sometimes balancing between the both sides is very also important to make a balance between the right and left sides. Okay, another question. Can we use ceramic crown in pedo? Because now, uh, because uh, I can't use it under 18 years. I know, can't use it under 18 years. So, uh, uh, long ago, when we started, I will be now talking about primary teeth. Long ago, when we started to think about an aesthetic alternative to the normal stainless steel crowns, we were striving to find a way. And uh, as we may all know, that was uh, the, the, the alternative was using a pre-veneered, what we call pre-veneered stainless steel crowns, which is a polymeric material covering a stainless steel crown. And it has been working for long. So the question was that at that time, why don't we do a ceramic alternative? And the answer was your question now. You are saying, I don't want to use ceramic or full ceramic respiration in children. So, and if you're talking about the age of 18, you're talking about the epithelial attachment issue, but it, the problem was not about the epithelial attachment, the problem was about the musculature and the possibilities of having a musculature that will, and the, the whole apparatus, the predontium and the joint and everything will be handling this very hard object. So by research, they went to having the zirconia crowns for the primary molars and later these youth, youth crowns for the permanent molars. And they were doing this with having a very good or highly polished surfaces, which decreases the amount of friction with the opposing, resulting in the least possible uh, damage or the least possible effects to the uh, occlusal apparatus. And about the epithelial attachment, which you definitely mean by uh, talking about uh, the uh, age of 18, which we all know, we all said that by the age of 18 is the best time to put a crown. But having a, sub a subgingival preparation is one key that will even uh, make it good and even if it's not good, we can repeat the crown at that age. If we have a loss of the uh, marginal integrity at that age, we can repeat that. And the last thing I want to say about this here is uh, uh, if we are doing CAD crowns, sometimes we have blocks, as you know, uh, it's not full ceramic. It's a mixture of uh, maybe polymeric materials with some ceramics and it can have a good uh, chance to again address the, the musculature and the occlusion of the child or a young child. Another question, 
Can I use resin reinforced glass ionomer as a management for moderate to, to severe MIH? You can and you cannot. Let's say why. We can say we can use this as a temporary thing. We all know that we have what we call atraumatic restorative treatment or an intervention that can be done without using a drill or using a, 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 a invasive technique. So putting a glass ionomer or a resin modified glass ionomer or a viscous glass ionomer can help in stopping the pores. Imagine with me that you are having a child who is having a, a, a sensitivity, as we mentioned, and having a defect, which is a moderate to severe, as you mentioned, and he is uncooptive, and we cannot administer local anesthesia properly, or we can administer local anesthesia, but there is high sensitivity. So the focus and your aim at this situation is to stop the problem, even if this uh, a solution is not a final solution. So you, all what you want to do is to stop the problem and postpone the final result, the final uh, situation or the final restoration for later. So in this case, we can use the technique described. We can put the SDF, which stops the decay and stops the sensitivity, and then put the glass ionomer or only put the glass ionomer but definitely we need at the end to put something that should be sealing and have long-term uh, properties or long-term success. And this may not be achieved using, and that's why um, my answer at the beginning, I said you may and may not. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the long-term success, sometimes you will not be able to use it for long-term. So it can be used in, in intermediate term to solve this solution, uh, this issue. Uh, an intraosseous anesthesia for MIH molars, uh, does it help? Definitely, the intraosseous anesthesia has a higher edge in delivering the uh, anesthetic to the uh, any tooth that we are talking about. It has an instantaneous effect and it can definitely be more profound than others but the degree of sensitivity is varying from one child to the other. Sometimes uh, normal anesthesia can go, and sometimes even if you gave with the regular techniques, intraligamentary or nerve block all coupled together, you still have sensitivity. But definitely the intra have a, a good effect, but it's not guaranteed, and in this sense, we can sometimes do, and that's usually what I do, before doing anything or putting your hand in such cases, you can just put fluoride varnish before doing anything. So we all know that the fluoride, aside from having the possibilities of decreasing the amounts of decay, it's mainly a desensitizing agent. Uh, so you may desensitize the tooth before starting the treatment, and this will help in the anesthesia. I've just had the case two days ago, I did the same. Started with uh, uh, fluoride varnish to decrease the sensitivity, and then I tackled that later by doing the anesthesia, and it was very helpful. How, how about the indirect process, the composite crowns in the state of a zirconian crown? Can we use it? The indirect composite crowns, uh, we have in this sense too, as we mentioned in the review that we mentioned, indirect composite crowns may be the form that is uh, the temporary crowns, as we've said, which is called the protem crowns of 3M SP or 3M now. So the protem crowns can be used, but again, it's not that reliable on the long term because it is not uh, uh, custom made. It's a stock thing that we customize to the tooth. So this is one alternative. And the other alternative is a composite, which is cat cut or a composite block or polymeric block that was done with the cat cam technology. And definitely this can be a better option than the ready-made.
uh, provided that you have the CERIC machine or you have the CAD machine, so you can do use or use the blocks or the uh, composite blocks to do the restoration with. So both options are there. One is more durable and the other is less durable. How uh, will you bond the zirconian younger crown on the tooth? We have uh, several cementing techniques that can be used in uh, looting the uh, crown to the, the, the primary or the permanent tooth. So the most commonly used uh, material is definitely the gloss ionomer and also the uh, bioactive uh, glass or bioactive uh, cements are also uh, described as being very good alternatives to have these zirconia crowns. But again, the most important thing is to have, because sometimes the zirconia is very stubborn when it comes to cementation, but if it has the proper uh, uh, fitting surface treatment, uh, the cementation will be perfectly uh, done and it's very durable. So again, glass enamel, resin cements, and uh, bioactive uh, cements can be all, all used to cement these crowns, provided we have the proper fitting surface treatment. Uh, last irrigation in RET, material of a choice for canal sealer in RET. The irrigation material? Yes. The irrigation material as advised by the American Academy of Endodontics is the sodium hypochloride. And I have to say here that sodium hypochloride was advised from the beginning of using the regenerative endodontic technique. But we have to say that it, the concentration changed by time. So it started by 5% and it went down as we've seen in the last guidelines to be one and a half percent. And its effect, because some studies found that it has a cyto cytotoxic effect. So the effect should be reversed by using the 17% EDTA after using the uh, uh, sodium hypochloride one and a half percent. So this is the irrigation uh, procedure that is so far, according to evidence and according to research, will get the optimum results. And again, all of these uh, irrigation should be done after minimal instrumentation. The most important thing when we are doing the regenerative endodontic treatment in the first visit is to do minimal instrumentation, not to uh, endanger or do any trauma to the preepical tissue at this age at this uh, stage, or uh, do any uh, irritation to the epithelial root to hertwig. And in the second stage or the second visit, which is usually two to four weeks after the first visit, we do the uh, provocation, if we may say, to the periapical area to provide leading and start the process of regeneration. Uh, how can differentiate between MIH and dental fluorosis? Actually, this goes through uh, a long process of uh, differential diagnosis. It, it needs a, a whole lecture to talk about that. But what we have to say is uh, 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 it's very uh, near in the features of hypoplasia. So the uh, MIH is very near to the features of hypoplasia and sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate between and also the fluorosis but the fluorosis is the main feature of fluorosis that it's not only affecting the anteriors and the first permanent molar it affects most of the teeth and this is a main difference and the main difference feature between them but definitely the developmental defects has a very big and wide uh, differential diagnosis process to, to, to go through. Uh, why do I face difficulty in achieving anesthesia with MIH cases? How to deal? Okay. The problem of having difficulty in achieving anesthesia for the MIH cases is mainly due to a very high inflammatory action that is usually found at the dentinopulpal junction. So 
by histology, they found that there is uh, usually there is a high inflammatory effect happening there, and what this was attributed to the uh, the defective enamel, and so the pathway of irritants from the outer surface to the inner surface. So the irritation or the permanent chronic irritation that is happening and not guarded by enamel is usually causing inflammatory reaction at the pulpal dentinal junction. And this is the cause of the frequent sensitivity that's happening. And again, as we mentioned earlier, we can step this down before intervening by using a desensitizing agent, maybe once or twice. And then after damping the sensitivity, we can start doing this. And sometimes another idea is to put an interim restoration, as we mentioned, the glass ionomer, and leaving the tooth to cool down from this chronic inflammation and then start doing that. But uh, if we need to intervene directly on that, we can use alternative techniques of local anesthesia. If block is not sufficient, we can go through intraligamentary, we can go through intraosseous. So there is a lot of alternatives that, that can get the profound anesthesia for that. Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, and this is documented uh, in literature, sometimes these cases may not respond except if we did general anesthesia. So if we have many of them, if we have two or three, and the same sensitivity is there, it cannot be uh, uh, controlled by the regular local anesthesia procedures, we can advise of having a general anesthesia uh, session to finalize the handling or the management. That was the last question, of Professor Osama. Thank you for being today with us. And I would like to thank everybody. And uh, we are sorry we, not, uh, we can't answer the whole questions. And if you have any questions, please email us. And uh, Dr. Osama will answer you. Thank you, Professor Osama. And uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you.